Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. No. Um. <laughs> This afternoon or this morning, depending on where you're from, I get to speak with this gentleman who has two movies about dinosaurs. His brother is in a band called Dragon. He's got dragons in this film. His wife co-produced the film with him. We are talking about the upcoming release called The Secret Kingdom. Matt Drummond, how are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks so, for having me on the show. Oh, listen, it's my pleasure. You made a fun film. I'm pretty sure two-thirds of the credits that aren't your name are pseudonyms just so you didn't get every single credit in this movie <laughs> I, I'm, yeah it probably looks a bit like that I, I certainly wore a lot of hats with this film absolutely yeah i i think someone sure. actually said online they said um drummond's name appears so many times it reminds me of tommy was in the room <laughs> <laughs> The only difference is your film was made in earnest and it was, yeah. well, actually so was his, but you know, it didn't have the, uh, the same impact that yours does in the fact that it's two siblings that get sucked into this magical kingdom. Mm, it's true. Very much so. And hopefully the acting's a lot better in ours as well. <laughs> well, you do have child actors, so it is kind of tough to, uh, to compare the children to the adults. That's right. Yeah, the I, I think the kids have an unfair advantage, actually. <laughs> Just a tad bit, because you know, kid, kids sit there and they're like, oh, "Okay, camera's on, cool." Adults will actually freeze. Yes, that's right. No kids, you can tell them to imagine anything, and they they literally do. Before we do get into it all, what is your fascination with dinosaurs? So typically, we at you know, as kids, I don't know if it's like this in Australia, but at least here in the U.S., it was either you were a dinosaur kid or a robot kid. I was a robot right. kid. You know, apparently, you're a dinosaur kid. I definitely was a dinosaur kid. I think there's a there's probably a robot or a dinosaur gene amongst uh, you know Homo sapiens that uh, they haven't quite found yet. But it, it seems like there's there's a universal fascination with the the animals. Um, in fact, I saw a meme the other day that said um, the sad thing about growing up is that no one asks you what your favorite dinosaur is anymore. And I'm like, well, that's not actually the case. <laughs> so maybe I never grew up, but uh, I looked like funny enough in my, my career, I just kind of fell in, into it because once I'd seen Jurassic Park and being a visual effects artist, I, the first thing I'd do is run home and start seeing if I can make dinosaurs like Jurassic Park back in 93. And um, then because I was doing documentaries, uh, I obviously did them well enough that everyone wanted me to do them for National Geographic and Discovery Channel and those kind of things. So I kind of became known as the dino guy for quite some time. Uh, it wasn't that I, I, I'm i a dino nut. In fact, I mean, yes, I know way too much about them that, you know, probably more than any adult should, but uh, it was all in service of the the work I was doing at the time. Is it also the fact that when Australia broke away from Pangaea is, the, is that none of your creatures have evolved and the entire continent is trying to kill you? <laughs> Probably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, basically, we've got, yeah, the saltwater crocodiles down here are literally dinosaurs. And, yeah, you don't want to be sharing the water or the beach bank or the river bank with those things, that's for sure. And, yes, uh, yeah, most things are trying to kill us, I think. That's, that's a fair assessment. Yeah, random spiders that show up that that are a millimeter long that you'll never see. Giant snakes. Yeah. You, I think you have what twenty six of the twenty seven world's most deadliest snakes are in Australia. Yeah, we like to do things properly down here. You know, <laughs> if you're going to kill your citizens, make sure you do it right. Yeah, well, it's just kind of that. It's more the Darwin Awards. If you get bitten by these things, knowing about them, well, then you're probably, you know, you're just helping the population out. You know. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> Matt, you wrote, you directed, and you produced this film, The Secret Kingdom. What was the mm. catalyst for it? I know you have a sister. Uh, is it slightly inspired by your relationship with your sister? Were you the anxious child that she was the rambunctious one? Like, how did this all come about? There, there, there's definitely... It's it's not my sister um, that... that uh, 
you know, the, the, the issues that I was exploring anxiety about. Um, it, it's definitely, you know, personal family stuff, but um, no, my sister's fine. Um, it's just, yeah, I was definitely exploring some ang anxiety and some, some of those deeper psychological concepts. And I really wanted to put those on screen in a way that hadn't been done before. And I found I found doing this film quite cathartic, actually. Yeah. What was the cathartic aspect of it? Was it a release for for you after all these years to let go of the anxiety? Was it because your imagination used to run wild and now you were able to reel it in? Like, how did this all come about? Uh, it, I mean, basically, by by going into some of the deeper concepts, it was almost bit therapeutic you know I, I i explored what the things were how why why they were there and how to deal with them better and that's I, I suppose i went on the same kind of journey to an extent you know in terms of the mechanics of understanding um, my own anxiety as the protagonist does you know and it is through that deeper psychological layer that things get worked out and how people do that in their own lives and how that manifests is um you know it's many and varied in fact my wife megan is um actually a clinical psychotherapist so she very much helped out in the uh in some of that you know deeper stuff um when we were doing the script so yeah it's uh yeah it's it's been a, a good journey this one for all sorts of reasons so you were the master's degree project and she's like, Hey, he got me my degree. Let's marry the guy. <laughs> uh, no, she, she decided to marry me back in 2017. Um, although we had been together for 11 years. So um, I, I think she knew what she was getting herself into. May, maybe that was the catalyst to go, okay. You know, they say they can't, uh, I can't change him, but I'm going to give it a go. <laughs> she is masochistic if she waited 11 years for you. <laughs> you don't know me that well <laughs> no but the woman waited 11 years so there has to be something there oh we both wait 11 years and then it, it became pretty obvious that um we were both a good bet so yeah uh, we're, we're we're in it for the long haul we're going the distance after the third child you're like all right i think it's time yeah yeah that's right well this is our third child actually <laughs> <laughs> well this is your third <laughs> film together so absolutely that's this, right yeah i believe this is the third film you've written Yes, it is. Yeah. So you have your two dinosaur movies. You have the secret, the secret kingdom. You know, when you sat down to write this film in particular, and the visual effects are stunning, by the by the way. So I get, you know, oh, I can only imagine from all the years of your own personal training, you're like, forget it. I'm not going to hire anybody else. I'm just going to do it myself. Well, there was a little bit of that, but but um, you know, I had a small team of modeling crew, but I also got um, into the the new Unreal Engine technology, and that allowed me to really respond to stuff in real time. And yeah, I mean, it's unheard of for a, a tiny crew to do twelve hundred and forty eight visual effects um, in four K for a cinema release. You know, so yeah, it's it was mind you, I did work out that um, in two and a half years, I worked the equivalent of six point eight years. So, you know, long hours and no weekends for a while, you know. Running on three hours of sleep. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. It was good for my mental health. It was good for my physical health, you know, all those kind of things. On the bright side, the year, the, the world was shut down for two and a half years. Australia, four. <laughs> um, you know, so you had the time to do it. Yes. Although I have to say, I am... Um, just before the pandemic hit, after we shot the movie, we decided that we'd go and um, explore Tasmania down, you know, down south on its own little island. And um, we got locked in there and uh, we decided to stay. <laughs> so, um, Tasmania was in lockdown for about six weeks. And then we were all roaming around for two years like there was nothing wrong, no masks, no no nothing you know so it's a it's a great little place to hide out that's for sure so for those that don't realize it tasmania is australia's florida <laughs> i'm not quite sure what that means so I, I don't think it's tasmania's florida politically it might be i don't know no I, because in florida they're like you know we did the whole two weeks to to curb the spread and then, oh, after, right. and then after two weeks 
Florida is like, all right, we're done. And then the rest of yeah. the country is like, no, 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 we'll give it another two weeks. I'm like, no, 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 we said two weeks. You got your two weeks. Right. Yeah, that's Tasmania. Yeah. Except that we are literally separated by a, a large body of ocean and we stopped everyone from coming in. And um, I think we existed on, you know, wine and fresh produce for two and a half years. So it was great. So, you know, uh, your liver and kidneys, thank you for it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> uh, with, with Peter being, let's say, relatively semi-autobiographical, because you had anxiety and Peter, ha Peter mm -hmm. has anxiety. And I want to try to pronounce the, the young man's name correctly. I know his first name, Sam. That's easy. Everingham? Bingo. Okay. Done. You know, uh, yeah. When you were casting the, him as, as Peter and then uh, Alayla Brown, who plays Verdi, his sister, you know, what was the casting process like? Did you audition children together? Did you audition them individually? You know, how did you finally decide on these two? Well, we cast um, Australia wide. Um, so basically, I, I saw many, 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 many candidates um alila was an absolute standout um just compared to the serve kids you know when she walked in she had craft beyond her years like she was only nine and yet she'd had a lot of experience and it, it really showed and funny enough all the boys i was getting through it was a good good caliber but they weren't weren't quite right and um it was through a, a friend of mine, um, Joe Samuel, who she was actually, um, she was uh, Mad Max's wife in the first Mad Max, Joanne Samuel. And uh, she'd been running a um, an acting school in the Blue Mountains, which is where I'm at at the moment. And she suggested Sam and I, I took one look at him. I was like, yeah, he's got the right look. Um, but can he, can he act anyway? I, I saw he's real and he was very, very good. So then it was a case of, insisting on bringing him into that full casting process and then putting him to together with Alila to see if there was, you know, the right chemistry and there was. And, yeah, I think the the two kids have done a remarkable remarkable job of carrying the film. And then Alison Parkinson and Christopher Gabardi are the yep. parents, David and Vivian, respectively. Uh, yeah. Take us through. I know Alice has been in a lot of stuff. She was also in Wolverine Origin. I believe she played Wolverine's uh, wife in that one, his first wife. And then yeah, right. Uh, yeah, Christopher's done so much. Was it just an easy? Oh, well, she was a stand out too. Um, well, once again, I cast I cast wide for 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 all of them. Uh, the Alice again, total standout uh, because Vivian had to, you know, she's of French origin and and speaks french in parts in the film um alice isn't french but she took uh, i i think she's got a degree in french she took you know tertiary french and um and she the the level of emotional depth she brought just to the casting session was just incredible so once again total standout chris gabardi he's been in um my previous film uh my pet dinosaur and he's just always note perfect he's and he's he's a good mate too so it was that was a no-brainer uh the the other major casting was darius williams as pling and um he he is an extremely talented young young actor um he's done three years of he did three years of uh at the the most prestigious acting school here in Australia. He was also on Home and Away, and he's just getting rave reviews in his theatre performances at the moment. Um, the reason I know that is because he's also my stepson. So he's... And uh, if you know anything about my films, you'll know he was the lead boy in Dinosaur Island. So... So nepotism is what you're telling me. Absolutely alive and well here. It's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, but, but only if they've got the skill. If they don't have got the skill to do it, well, that, that just doesn't help, does it? <laughs> That's when you make them go make sandwiches for the craft services department. Oh, no, look, I'd be making sandwiches for him. He's far too talented. No, I'm saying if he didn't have the talent. Yeah, he knows. Yeah. Sorry, what was that? 
Uh, I was going to say, if he didn't have the dark out for a second. sandwiches, and then uh, Gabriella Chen plays the Shroud, or at least one of the incarnations of the Shroud. Yes. Which is uh, a very interesting yes, absolutely. character. Yeah. And the development of how the character unfolds, because I don't want to give away too much. It has its U.S. release on June 9th. And, you know, the aspect of that character and how we see it develop and then interact with Peter and we know there's something there, but where the power is actually harnessed is truly, truly remarkable. Mm. How did you decide on going that route? Was this something that your wife ha had discovered uh, through her research when it comes to anxiety and psychoanalysis? Or did it just flow perfectly with the story and like the fourth rewrite? It was... Um... It was more a story point. It was basically the shroud is the embodiment of fear and all its incarnations. It can be a friend, it can be a foe, you know, and that's the that's the aspect of things that I wanted to explore. So obviously, without giving anything away there, that um it's it is a very important character. It plays into Peter's psyche, both good and bad. So they're the kind of things where, uh, yeah, I really wanted to, to to explore that side of things. Yeah, um, you know, the, I suppose the other thing too is that fear can fear can take many forms, and in your film it does. Mm. Mm. Uh, what was the original shoot like before? Obviously, all the you know, uh, digital effects that you incorporate into it. What was the original shooting schedule like? And then mm. the added effects that you've done to get all these characters on screen. So it's almost two separate shoots in, in reality. Actually, it kind of was. We did, before The Mandalorian came out and the whole visual effects on set with the volume and the LED screens was available, I'd seen um, Tom Cruise in Oblivion and how they'd done that with the, the, the projection systems, and I thought it would be really great to see if we could do something similar to that. So obviously we used the Unreal Engine technology and we had some ultra-short throw projection uh, projectors and some ambient light rejecting screens. So we were able to create a sort of a box volume of around about three by three uh, meters squared. And that um, some of those actual shots ended up in the film and they worked really, really well as a ground truth for the compositing as well. So we could see the way the light was actually, you know, playing through the hair or, or you know, when you get up close on a, on a close-up lens, like an 80 mil lens, you actually get this subtle refraction around the edges of things, you know, slow, slight distortion around um, things. And so it really informed the way the compositing was going to be when we did the green screen shoot as well. So essentially we, we spent probably about two weeks shooting with the screens, which kind of acted as a bit of a rehearsal for the kids because it allowed them to be able to, visualize the environments and some of the creatures that were already pre-done so they were able to have some understanding of what the the final thing was was going to look like or what we we're going for uh and then we spent the part of the shoot on green screen so it's definitely a combination of the two it's mostly green screen but as i said that that reference from the the screens was invaluable in total the shoot took 28 days wow so you pulled this off in 28 days in the initial shoot and then two years adding everything back in to give it a coherent look yeah and that's down to the new technology it's a whole new paradigm shift now which is absolutely wonderful it's incredible what, where we've come it's also interesting how history repeats itself, because if we go back into cinema well over 100 years ago, you know, we had the painted screen on a reel. So the guy is on a mechanical horse bobbing up and down while the picture behind him is rotating. And now we've done it digitally instead of somebody just spinning the background. 
Yeah, absolutely. In fact, we had, well, it wasn't a mechanical horse. It was literally just a great big fiberglass horse the kids are sitting on when they're riding um, the dragon. So in those big scenes where we see them galloping through the forest, they're just on a green screen sitting on top of a fiberglass horse. Incredible. And I do want to mention Christopher's character, David, one more time. Uh, I like that he's mm. the extremely involved and imaginative parent. So he allows the children's mm. creative side to to be flourished and to nurture it, which we don't see too often, that, that being the father's role. Uh, how close, again, was that mm. to your own personal life? Are you the imaginary nurturer or was your father that for you? Because you're an artist, your brother's Absolutely. an artist, so there's art throughout the entire family. Yeah, that's the observation. My father was definitely, um, oh, my dad was a superhero growing up. I thought the guy could literally fly. He, everything was possible. I mean, we we grew up as, I, I was going to be a musician as well as my, my siblings and I thought that's what I was going to do. I thought I was going to be the next Van Halen. Of course, um, then I realised that there was no room for that by the end of the 80s and uh, the early 90s. The guitar solos had well and truly gone by grunge, you know, by the time grunge hit. But, uh, yeah, Dad was Dad was a big nurturer of our, our creative pursuits, absolutely. And, I mean, so was Mum too. I mean, the fact that, the fact that Mum could endure us playing music at the top of our top of the, the capabilities of our amplifiers at the time and my brother with a full drum kit uh, instead of them telling us we couldn't do it they built us an entire music room and and made sure it was all soundproofed and those kind of things so they were very much encouraging of of our pursuits that's fantastic and if your parents are still around mm. what have they thought of your films as of late you know, going from the two dinosaur films to now this one over here, the secret, the secret kingdom. Well, I mean, this one here is definitely a, um, it, it's a very different offering to my two previous films, and uh, yeah, they they had a, a very big emotional response to it, so that was nice. But they are my parents too, so it's a, it's a, a primed audience. It's built in. They ha they have to love it, is what you're saying. Yeah, well, you know, I, I kind of I kind of feel like that maybe that's the case. <laughs> well, that dad would tell me if things were not quite right. He always we'd always leave leave the cinema as kids, and he totally dissected the internal inconsistencies of the plot or something like that. So, yeah, we we definitely had healthy discussions around creativity as well. And in doing this film and your wife being involved, your stepson being involved, you know, it being a family affair and a small cast as well, did it almost feel like theater because it was so intimate in making the movie? I suppose that's not a bad analogy. Yes. I mean, it's certainly, it's if you stepped onto one of my sets, it wouldn't feel like, you're on a, a typical film set. Um, I like to keep things agile. I like to keep them them calm. I like to keep them things moving as as much as possible. But I also do like to be as collaborative with my team as possible as well. I, I've got a, a really good first AD, a, a guy called Graham Mitchell. Although he he does only like to be. Uh, only go by the name G Wiz, which is his uh, his moniker, <laughs> it's his nickname. That's a, that's all we ever call him. You know, whenever I call him Graham, he's like doesn't doesn't actually respond. He doesn't know what that is. Um, but he's he's fantastic, and he's he really has my back on set. You know, because going into these kind of films, it's a battle. Everything's a battle. You know, you're battling time. You're battling resources you've been all sorts of stuff and look i have to say too i know a lot of other directors thrive on the process of shooting and being amongst all that kind of thing for me that's probably the most stressful part of the entire process because it's where the most amount of money and the least amount of control reside you know it's a you know things things can any thing that can happen with
Yeah. Were there any hiccups on this set that that you had to pivot just enough from the original script, but still keep it in line with what your vision was? Um, while shooting, no, there weren't any hiccups. We had a very controlled environment. I mean, obviously shooting uh, predominantly in the green screen studio, we were able to, to mitigate against all sorts of, you know, pressures. You know, there was no sound issues. There's no weather issues. Uh, here in Australia, we can only have kids working for two four-hour blocks in a day. So we were able to adhere to, you know, all of the the rules that are required when hiring minors and also, you know, the, the kind of guidelines that you want to work a crew for as well. So I don't like to to go outside of those kind of things. Plus, I mean, those rules are there for a reason. I mean, it's common sense. A kid can't work an eight-hour day. You know, after, after a couple of hours, they're, they're tired anyway. So you've got to give them the breaks. So you're not going to get anything from them. But uh, it did mean that, by building, in particular, the bedroom set, I could have golden hour for as long as I needed, or I could have night time for as long as I needed, and and it was never a problem. So it was a it was a pretty smooth shoot. I mean, we did we did go over a little bit. I think we extended by four days from the initial uh, schedule, but it wasn't anything that was too disruptive. And I do want to ask the the characters that are fulfilling the prophecy or seeking the prophecy, uh, the armadillo looking ones, mm -hmm. I don't want to give too much away from that. How did you decide on the, on that particular character design? Okay. Okay. So online, I was looking for um, some new uh, animals. Like I, I got a, I got a very good piece of advice from a producer I worked with once who said, Whatever you do, show the audience something they've never seen before. So I was online looking for, for all sorts of weird and wonderful animals, and I saw the little armadillo, and it was just a gif. I think it was like a three-second gif. And it was the armadillo there, and then in a, an instant, it just rolled up into a ball. I was like, oh, okay, I've never seen that before. And I started looking at those guys, but they didn't quite have the right look and the right feel for what I wanted in an animal. And I kept looking around and I came across a, um, a YouTube video for this funny little pangolin character that was living with a, it was a rescue girl. They called him honey boo boo. And he was living with the rescuer and he was getting into the fridge and he was getting into the washing and he just had incredible personality. And he also rolled up into a ball defensively. And I was like, okay, that's it. That's where we need to go because it embodied the sort of softer underside of, of, a, of the sort of narrative and had the external hard shell of, of you know, somebody who – it just became an allegory in itself, you know. Uh, I am tremendously pleased and surprised in how much you did with such a little staff and crew – to, to give us this film, The Secret Kingdom. Um, before I do let you go, you know, what is the one takeaway you want audiences to get from this film? As we can see, there's been inspiration from Never Ending Story, The Labyrinth, and, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Dark Crystal, and so, so many other fantasy films of the 80s, to now what you've brought into the 21st century. I suppose the big takeaways will be, look, I think when an audience watches it, I want them to just, you know, feel it, immerse themselves in it and, and be taken away on that on the journey that the protagonist is experiencing. Once they've seen it once, I hope that they would be um, curious enough to go back and check some key points out. And um, once you see the twist... Uh, a lot of people have wanted to go back and just double check a couple of things. And there are, we do telegraph what the, the twist may be throughout the film. There, there are setups throughout. So it doesn't just hit without notice. There, there are setups and payoffs. And the, the whole thing was, uh, you know, I hope it's been crafted in a way that, that makes audiences 
go back and watch again. Well, let's hope there's repeat viewings on June 9th here in the United States, whether on VOD or in limited theatrical release, as it's being distributed by Saban Films. Matt Drummond, where can we find you on social media if we want to connect with you? Um, currently, you can you can connect on uh, the Secret Kingdom is is online. Um, you can you can have a look at some of the other work I've done through my um, visual effects company site, uh, HiveStudios.com. Um, we've also got the Secret Kingdom the movie the Secret Kingdom movie.com, which is where we are we're putting up all sorts of things related to the film as well. Fantastic. Matt Drummond, has been a great pleasure chatting with you today. Congratulations on The Secret Kingdom. What you, your wife, and the small crew have been able to pull off visually and in a story that is relatable to quite a few people these days, congratulations. Thank you very much. And, you know, thanks for having me on. It's been great to talk to you. Absolutely, man. It's been my pleasure.